the concern yeah. about that. Yeah. And I, and I, I don't know if it's concern about that. I think. I love it. I think it's a lot. Sounds good. Okay. All right. Let's see. Who else do we got? Oh, Dan's on there too. Okay. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All right. Uh, we're going to – I do have 5 o'clock, so we're going to get started. Um, I will say before we get going on the work session things, um, we have about three hours' worth of work to do in one hour. So brevity and concise presentations will benefit your cause. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so tonight we're doing the concept review for the Chaffee County government's plan development overlay request. Um, they're in a single, single family residential zone district, which doesn't make sense for their current use and their future uses. So they're applying for a plan development overlay. Joe DeLuca and Sarah Whittington are both here tonight. Joe has a short presentation to show you. Um, just for their requ what they're requesting. A couple things is they're requesting the overlay closely aligned with the C1 zone district standards and use table, and they're requesting a deviation from the parking standards. You all will see all of that with the application materials when we bring them forward. The public hearing is scheduled for July 26th with Planning Commission, and the first reading will come to City Council on August 17th. And I could answer any questions if you have any. Otherwise, we could have Joe come up and. All right. Did anybody have anything right off the bat? All right, Joe. I didn't mean to scare you guys into total silence. <laughs> <laughs> I like knowing what the what the goal is. We're going to go fast. So um, next slide. Uh, so real quick, you know, like uh, Christy said, it's this is the R1 zone, and it's been a non-conforming use for 81 years. And uh, so the city staff and the county determined the best approach would be to do a PD. Uh, we know that in the, your new land use code, there might be a civic zone or something developed for that. This could be kind of a template for that. But um, it just it seems like the only way to go forward in the future uh, rather than continue with a non-conforming use. Next slide. So um, what we've done for a PD plat is we've surveyed the whole site. Um, the plat will look something like what you see on the screen. So it shows all the buildings, all the existing parking, the new rear lane that was approved last year that's under construction right now, and the new trees that are being planted as part of that landscaping plan for that. So that would be our base map for the, for the new, new, uh, um, new PD, and it shows like the um, and I'll talk about it a little bit later, but we're going to tear down the old EMS garage. It shows the existing condition um, uh, of, with the site. <coughs> Next slide. So um, just as a quick review, it's, the campus is 3.87 acres, and it's surrounded by streets. Uh, so it doesn't really have any exact you know, uh, right adjoining property owners. Um, and then, as you know, Tonoff Park is across the street, and, and David Lady did a great job last year and did some design changes and created more parking on the street so we wouldn't have that big parking lot on the lawn. And, um, and it has the administration building, uh, the courts building, uh, dispatch and jail building, uh, the State Patrol Communications Tower, and the EMS garage on, on the site right now. Next slide. Um, I'm not going to go over the dimensional standards. Christy already mentioned. We started out with C1 as the base. We're actually going with less dense, co less coverage than C1 because we think it fits more the, the site not to go that far. Uh, but in general, it's in terms of a lot of things like you know institutional height and everything, it's, it's like the C1 zone. Next slide. So um, why are we doing this? Uh, we're gonna, the plan is to build an annex next year 
on onto the courthouse there you know as the county is growing the staff is growing and they need bigger meeting room sizes um, and um, also um, they need a place for emergency management and, and other new staff so um, the place we've chosen is between the existing court annex or uh, courthouse annex and the courthouse where the actual courts are and right now that is a, a an access lane to the rear which we're replacing with a new access lane and it has a handful of parking spaces maybe like 10 12 parking spaces in it so it's a, that's the picture you see of the existing next slide this is what the picture will look like with the annex on it from the front and we'll be coming to you with a you know with a plan for that after the pd uh, but the pd would basically make what we're doing a conforming use next slide this is the picture from the back so that garage on the left hand side is an old EMS garage that has needed to be tore down for a long time so we'd be tearing that down and putting some parking in front of where that is and some landscaping and next slide that's what the building will look like from the back so I think it'll be a big improvement there's really a hole there that's not very attractive we're filling in the hole um, next slide so, um, as I mentioned, we think the main, you know, new land use code will include a That's special a zone for council. civic buildings, but um, a, um, such as the Chaffee County campus and the Tober building, no and clue. churches and stuff like that. So um, the PD could act as a template for that future change, but the PD will really bring it into a conforming uh, use. Uh, it's been, it was there before there was zoning. So. So anyway, I'd be happy to answer any questions. All right. Anybody have any anything right now? No. Okay. Very right, good. All right. Um, so I guess uh, does the Planning Commission have any comments they would like to add quickly? And certainly the comments of the chat are appropriate for those as well. Can you guys hear us out there? <laughs> uh, I don't think they can, so <laughs> there you go. Can you guys? We're, I think so. The only ones that we've been muting are ones that we had, we were receiving some feedback from. Yeah, I just, I muted Dan just because there was some noise coming okay. from there. And I but he can unmute himself at any point. Um, can you guys hear us out there, though? There's a lot of blank stares that I'm Francie's okay. not in your head yet. There we oh, go. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, all right, well, we'll, keep, we'll keep moving along. Um, I, I think uh, probably it makes sense to follow through on that. Um, I know my, my first reaction when I saw this was, wow, we have one of the coolest art deco buildings in the state with an addition that's kind of a a weak attempt at art deco followed by something that you guys drew that looks like you just gave up <laughs> um so hopefully between now and then you can rethink uh matching the architecture to that amazing original building that we have that is something yeah, Francie. PT, if I might, this is Francie. Uh, we didn't hear any of the first part of that meeting. Okay. Well, um, did so you, just were you saying able to, that that's okay. what's happened. All right. Uh, we're talking about uh, the overlay there where the courthouse is. It's R1 right now. Uh, doing a PD overlay so that they have some commercial use rights in there. Um, along with right, but was there but was there a presentation of some kind there was a short one okay it was we mostly the uh, we just didn't hear yeah, the it was in your packet i so think you know. so it was yes. pretty s simple um and i don't know if we can flash through those cards if you want um can you see that stuff it should be i think we need to share our screen yeah, you can share we're not seeing it yeah I think our uh there we go there we are okay so let's uh let's just flash through this real quick for these guys and I'll do the abbreviated uh, 
So there's kind of the kind of the justification and the reasoning. Next. And that is uh, the outline of the county property up there and what that PD overlay would be is just the third uh, on to the Mesa area um, where the courthouse is and the um, county offices, right? Okay. And then uh, again, just a description of what's up there and where it is. I think everybody's familiar with that. All right, and then talking about the switch to dimensional standards and uh, what they would like to do. And I think it's, it'll be more aligned with the C1 district is what they're asking for. Um, and including some of the institutional heights that would be um, um, allowed for hospitals, schools, and uh, uh, public uh, and for governments. So 54 feet, right? Um, does that about cover what you said, Joe? <laughs> I think so, pretty much, okay. <laughs> Flat would really be the existing conditions right. that we have right now. Yep. And and the new dimensional standards. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, really, I think right now tonight with this joint meeting, the goal is to give a nod and say yeah, or a shake of the head, saying yes or no. Um, we think that it is appropriate to to uh, follow through and come forward with some plans, right? Is that about right, Christy? Yes. Yeah. So, all right. Questions? Francie. Let me unmute her. <laughs> yeah, hold on. I'm sorry, she was, she was just having some feedback earlier. So. Yeah, you got, hold on one second. All right. Okay, I just, um, you know, I, I understand the need uh, to move it out of R1 and the PD is the way to do it. Um, I do, I just want to, for the applicant, I just want to say I have a couple of, things that we'll probably dive into more in the planning commission with parking and uh, lot coverage and landscape area. Um, I want to be sure that we're consistent with the uh, requirements that we asked them for originally with trees and how many be planted and arborists to be looking at that. Um, so I just want them to know that personally, I would like more information about all those things and how it fits into the, you know, to the plan. Thank you. All right. Um, anybody else out there in the computer world have any questions? All right. How about in, in here? Well, yeah. There's a small comment and a question. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm concerned about the, the percentage of landscaping uh, much more on the height. Right. Yep. And I think that was. Uh, Joe did talk a little bit about that in his presentation and trying to maintain some of those uh, uh, big green areas around there. So um, I think that'll be an important piece of the PD when they bring that forward. And I, I won't argue with um, the mayor when I you know, say it's, it is basically just a box with windows right now. It would, look, it would be nice if it looked any nicer than yeah. that. Yeah. Um, as a, a suggestion, right? Suggest, uh, yeah, all suggestion. We typically don't have much power to dictate taste and style, but <laughs> we can nice. certainly make suggestions. <laughs> or big trees to just cover it then. Yes, that's also good. All right. I don't know. It looks a lot like that Jamaica uh, home where the woman who was the witch who, you know, killed all of her husbands. It looks a lot like that to me. <laughs> I'm, I'm not familiar. <laughs> <laughs> I get, yeah, we're not gonna we're not yeah we're not gonna waste a lot of time tonight talking about uh, design and style though I think the point's been made on that. Yeah, I think so. Um, any other cons concerns about this from anybody though? I'm not seeing anything, and I think we all understand the need up there. Um, and the uh, benefit that it'll bring to the community. So um, I think we're looking forward to working with you guys and making this happen. All right, great. Thanks so much. Uh, Joe, that was the shortest presentation I've ever seen you do, man. I, I appreciate it. <laughs>
I think, the, I think the challenge is now we know he's capable of it. Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, thanks, planning guy. Well, are they going to be for the amplified sound? Is that or is that just us? Uh, it's just for the city council. All We're right, intended great. just for the city council. All right. Thanks, planning guys. I think that's all we needed y'all for. Um, what about for the short term rental discussion? Um, yeah, I think that's more council. Certainly, you can, they can stick around, around and sure. listen to that and uh, give us some input in the chat or the uh, questions if you would like. Um, who's got this one? So I'll, I'll take this one to start. Um, you have a memo in your packet from uh, me with regard to uh, amplified sound permits that we issue here in, in the city. This was requested at your last meeting to be placed on a work session agenda to discuss. So I'll try to be as brief as possible. I'm assuming um, everyone has seen the memo. We did note a few options um, to uh, possibly change or amend our process that might make it both easier and, and better to understand for both businesses and for residents. One of the things that we bump into is that uh, having to issue an individual permit for each and every event that occurs is cumbersome as it is now. And all of those things don't necessarily get extended to the law enforcement officer that might be out on the street at 11 o'clock p.m. on a Saturday and then wrangling me up to find out, did we actually issue a permit for this, um, is a little bit challenging. Uh, we have had some, uh, you've, you've received some comments and feedback from uh, constituents that have been concerned about noise and the late duration of it. Um, what we've done is, is suggested that maybe there's a, a middle or balancing ground that we can try to reach uh, where we maybe limit total number of events also along with um, a, a maximum time period into the evening. Anything above and beyond that would need to come back and go to the council. But what I've found in at least over the last two and a half years that I've been here is that I typically get uh, a, a very hastily uh, put together application uh, for music because somebody had an opportunity to, to nab a band that's coming through town. Or, hey, I, I have a friend that can play this weekend, would really love to have them be able to play at the, in the beer garden at my, my place of business. So um, to, one of the things that we would struggle with if we were to require every single amplified sound permit to come before the council would be that it requires about four weeks of pre-planning on that between noticing um, surrounding property owners, giving ample time to put all this stuff together and put it in the newspaper and everything else, probably be looking about a month out. That's typically what we've found to not be the case when you're looking at live music for small venues, um, and I'll, I'll be honest, bars and restaurants that, we're, that we have here in Salida. So we, uh, we made a few suggestions um, in, in the memo uh, with regard to that. Uh, to where we keep at least a portion of the amplified sound permit process to be administrative so that it's easier for somebody to come and approach me as your administrator with fairly short notice so that they can have an amplified sound pro or uh, amplified sound permit again we, we suggested limiting the total number uh, to the summer season uh, between may and, and september uh, i use that as summer season i know it's a little bit longer here so maybe we we ex expand that but have a total number in that time period um, that they could apply for as part of that administrative process. Anything above and beyond that would need to come before the city council to get approval. And so because of that, people would know in advance, you know, hey, if I'm trying to get something booked in September, I gotta go talk to the council and we have a public process for that. One of the last things, or one of the other things that we said was, or suggested, uh, was anything past 10 p.m. that it would need to come to you and get approval for that. We did have some interest in that. Uh, during FIBARC, obviously, and we um, informed people as they were, they were applying for permits that no, 10 o'clock was a shutoff. And thankfully, I think it actually worked um, better than what we anticipated uh, in terms of just the total amount of noise that was created at night. We were able to go walk around after 10 p.m., and there were a few folks that were firing up some independent garage bands on rooftops and a few other places. So uh, the cops were able to um, talk with them fairly quickly, and, and they shut down. I, I witnessed it myself walking around with those folks, they shut down pretty fast, and I think we were able to find an a easier middle ground than what we were anticipating. And then lastly, just in residential neighborhoods, um, anytime that we get a residential permit, we would go and reach out to the neighbors around there. Um, oftentimes what you'll see with amplified sound in residential areas is for like a graduation party or uh, maybe a, a small wedding or something like that. Um, but that process in and of itself would require you know, reaching out to the neighbors before you would approve anything. I just think that's appropriate in more of the, those residential settings. 
Um, we do have some areas where there's going to be natural conflict. Um, any area where there's kind of this mix of a downtown commercial core and residences nearby, that's going to there's always going to be a rub there, right? So um, how do we get find that middle ground? Again, we're just trying to come up with some ideas around that. But uh, otherwise, the program overall, I think, um, generally works. Uh, we don't seem to have too many conflicts with regard to amplified sound. What we oftentimes have more conflicts with is sounds of large trucks driving through town or other activities going on, construction activities early in the morning, um, you know, just a host of other things that don't necessarily involve live music at the handful of establishments that we have downtown. So with that, I'd love to, to hear any feedback that you might have. Uh, you did receive uh, an email earlier this afternoon from one of the um, one of the bar proprietors um, that has some different thoughts than what staff does on this. Um, one of the things that we would just, again, throwing out there, if we were to bring this back, it would come back as an ordinance. There would be a public hearing on this. You could take testimony at that time, but just kind of wanted to bounce some ideas off you for that. So. Great. Thank you. Uh, thoughts on that? Questions for? I, I, I guess the other question would be um, if we were to take on hearing extensions past 10 o'clock like for for noise would that also apply to construction cruiser cruiser just like we insist on starting at six in the morning would that also apply <laughs> so they are <laughs> their construction crews are actually limited in when they can okay. operate it's i believe it's between 7, 7 a.m and, and 8 p.m or or that 9 i can't remember right. which i'd have to go back and check um, but most of those um, instances of noise are limited <laughs> already this is specific just to amplified sound so we get complaints about a whole host of other noise, right? Just ambient noise that we have in town or the, I get the email from somebody who, who lives in Smeltertown from the ambient vibration from the, <laughs> ho or the hospital's rooftop uh, yeah. units. So we get a lot of other feedback about noise um, than just amplified sound. Yeah, yeah. So th thanks, Drew, for your work. Um, um, you, you brought that up on our table because of my request. I had heard from several citizens um, that um, complained about about the conflict of uh, basically this is symptomatic for being a town that um, needs to uh, be prepared to to serve tourists, and there are these typical conflicts. Um, my idea when I threw out why why don't we have public hearings about about this there was that um, in any specific situation talking about it uh, always seems to be the most logical thing to me um, but I realized that that was not uh, a good um, suggestion I realized that would be um, too much effort for for staff as well as for people that spontaneously um, put something up. So I'm, I'm just wondering whether there's any other way to facilitate um, good communication between the people that supply the amplified sound and, and um, citizens that feel bothered by it. I think in this particular instance, you have um, probably a very small number of proprietors that are uh, extending past uh, what would be considered a reasonable hour to, to play music into the evening. You have a very small number that are, um, you know, that, that are taking advantage of amplified sound. I, I haven't issued an amplified sound permit on Highway 50 since the time that I've been here. It's typically concentrated in uh, our downtown area, and I believe it's only three venues at this point. So we're really talking about a very small number, um, actually four venues if you count uh, what um, what Monarch is doing over at their Shredders uh, uh, facility there. So anyways, I, I guess that um, in terms of better communication, I think, uh, you know, oftentimes it's kind of a good neighbor rule where if you're going to be having loud music, maybe you should go talk to your neighbors um, to, to at least let them know, to, to talk about ways in which they might be able to mitigate it, hours of operation, things like that. And, and I understand that maybe that might be a, a step too far for some uh, proprietors just because of the nature of their business. So uh, in in stepping into the middle of this, we're trying to play referee. And I think the only way to find to find out how to or, or to figure out a, the right role to be at is to just establish a baseline for everyone 
that everybody knows going into it and anything that steps outside of that would have to again come back for this public forum and what's going to be acceptable and what's not is really your your call as the as the city council yeah th thanks Drew. and and looking at it on a second thought i'm i'm not proposing any changes Mr. Mayor, I like the idea to um, make it a blanket permitting. I think 10 o'clock is way too early, particularly since uh, we lost our biggest venue downtown that played until 2 o'clock in the morning. So 10 o'clock is a far cry from 2 o'clock in the morning. And I understand that 2 o'clock in the morning is not reasonable for outdoors. But downtown is downtown. Uh, everybody who goes there, everybody who chooses to stay there, Everyone knows that. I lived in a place where you were kept up at night by rock and roll and in the morning by gospel singing. So that's really the best of both worlds. And really, isn't that what we all want, to be surrounded by music all the time? So I would like it to be easy for people to provide music. This is an art community. Uh, it is one of the things that has made Salida strong. It's one of the things that attracted me here. Um, because it was a dead little town except for the music scene. I don't want to see that music scene compromised. Thank you. Okay. I would just follow up with that and saying to, to limit um, those permits um, to those uh, venues would be to limit their success. I would look at the more um, amplified sound happening, the more uh, bands playing as uh, more success for our local businesses. So it would be counterintuitive me, for me to support anything other than the success of our local businesses. I was looking for, is there a decibel level for the bands? Yeah. So, there's, there's so Amplified Sound, once you apply for that permit, there's no cap on that Amplified Sound. So that's one of the other components in all of this and where do you measure it from and a, a whole host of things like that. So that permit gives you the ability to go above the either anywhere from 50, 50 to 65 to I think up to 80 decibels between properties as they adjoin each other depending on the zone district that they're in and the use of those properties. So anything above that, um, that 80 decibel limit needs to come and get an amplified sound permit from the city. Now again, we're just talking about amplified sound, not trucks and construction activities and all that other kind of stuff. Yeah. So it kind of makes it, it, we have to differentiate between those, those two items. Um, but, uh, and thank you, Sarah brought it up on the screen there. You can see kind of what the source is and what the receiving property is, um, it should be expected to receive there. Uh, but those are actually fairly low levels. If you look at the uh, accompanying uh, sheet that listed off what those, you know, like a vacuum is, you know, 70, decibels or something like that. I mean, it's kind of crazy how, how fast those things kind of ramp up at the end. Uh, but again, the, the hope in all of this was to try to establish better boundaries for people so that they knew what to expect going in. Um, I, I, I felt like just having some sort of shut off time that you knew that, okay, if you, if you end at this time, you're good to go as far as just kind of a general rule goes. If you want to go anything past that, again, you can come and have the have the debate or the forum in the well here at the city council meeting and and really have the ability to to provide some feedback on it yep, yep. all right yeah Jane? um i'm not exactly sure how i feel because where i live i can hear music from downtown sometimes and you all know where i live i'm up on the mesa um so i i certainly sympathize with residents who are kept up at night by music. Um, I also understand that it's a artistic community and music is important. Um, so I'm thinking, I, I like the idea of us having some sort of baseline and if you go past the baseline, then you come to us for permission. That makes a lot of sense to me. Mm -hmm. I should note too that in the three years that I've been here, we've not denied, or we've, yeah, we've not denied right. a single amplified sound permit. Uh, we've also not held a public hearing, which it's allowable under the code, which I would hold the public hearing. I don't know what criteria I would balance any of that public hearing on. I'm not an elected official, so I'm not representing constituents in the same way that you do. So the process is a little wonky for me um, in terms of managing that because I don't have any criteria that says this is good and this is bad, mm -hmm. right? We've tried to keep to this general, very general rule of 10 o'clock for, for most live music 
uh, and and we really haven't had too many applications for anything later than that. So it seemed like that was like just this natural coursing barrier that already exists there. So again, anything beyond that, we would suggest if you if you want us to bring this back to you as an ordinance change, we would suggest that that would be the boundary that we would start with. Yeah, that's my boundary. Don't call after ten. <laughs> <laughs> That's just a standard common courtesy boundary. <laughs> it is. All right. Um, well, I think, do you have something, Mike? I was just going to say, uh, most of the bands really don't come close. Maybe grab your mic so right. folks can hear you. Most of the bands don't really come close, but there are those occasional ones that are the bigger bands, the louder bands that bother people sometimes. But by far, most of them are not at that level that's a problem. Right. Um, um, and and type of music does have an impact on this yeah. discussion. If you read about and not to compare um, <coughs> the stage at the Tap House to Red Rocks, but if you look at the conversations they're having in Morrison about certain types of music and how that impacts mm -hmm. the residents there, it's a the EDM music and everything else that's going on there is having a real. Um, it, it's a very interesting discussion. I think so, we can cross that barrier when Bass Nectar wants to play I here. I agree with you yeah. fully. I agree with you fully. people or something. Yeah. Pretty lights is my yeah, favorite. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, so I guess really the question is, did you guys feel like this is getting us close to mm -hmm. where we could actually sit down, have an ordinance in front of us, and a reasonable discussion to come to a conclusion? Yes. yes. Okay. It's a yeah. Good direction. Yeah. Okay. It's not a huge problem right now, but we need we need to talk about it some more. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Very good. Um, let's move on to the water and sewer system fee schedule. I've been taking some quick talking lessons from Nina, so I'm going to get through this real quick. Um, obviously, we've got ourselves a housing emergency, um, and uh, one of the uh, points of which we've been looking at addressing this from is various incentives or other changes that may um, help in uh, creating a, a playing field for the creation of more rental units. And we've heard from local developers over the last few years especially um, that one of the potential barriers to creating rental projects, uh, such as apartment buildings and, and other similar developments, uh, is the system development fees, uh, which currently charge on a per unit basis. And uh, I've got a quick little presentation here to kind of go over some proposed changes for that would we'll love to get your feedback after this um let me see if this is working actually all right uh we've got a rapidly changing housing landscape um a lot of the individual homes that folks is, <coughs> folks have been renting out or getting sold out from underneath them for folks that um either want to move here work remotely or as retirees so we're losing a lot of our um rental housing stock as it uh, currently exists uh, through those means as well as short-term rentals and, and other uh, situations. Um, rental housings are really been identified as the, the type of housing option that's needed the most right now um, in the immediate term just to get roofs over people's heads. 64% of the county workforce earns uh, between 60% and 120% AMI with the bulk of those being in the 80 to 100% AMI range right now. Um, the approximate median rent um, as of May 2020, and this was uh, you know, rel relatively casual data that was put together by Chafee Chief Housing Office um, with some surveys that uh, showed that one bedroom was approximately, the median was at 1275 and two bedrooms was 1400. Those numbers actually correspond fairly well to um, the, the AMI ranges of the folks out there um, within our workforce um, at, at an affordable range. So um, right now, as we've determined, it, it's, it's not so much an affordability issue, um, though there is that aspect certainly on the, on the um, for sale side of things, but as far as rental units go, it really is a supply issue. Um, as you all know, we've got a 48 unit LIHTC project that'll be um, available as of next summer. Um, estimating an additional 46 units uh, that are anticipated to rent between 70% and 100% AMI, perhaps by the end of this year, but still it is just a drop in the bucket of their overall housing needs, um, especially if you're basing that off of the housing needs analysis of 2015 that uh, really was looking at 
probably up to um, a, a few hundred units throughout the county being built each year over 10 years. We're well behind that curve. Um, so the current system de development fee methodology for rental projects and complexes, um, as I mentioned, it's on a per unit basis and uh, multifamily units are charged at 75% of single family buildings. So each unit would, would pay uh, $10,641 for the system development fee. Um, as a theoretical example, a 20 unit apartment uh, building would incur about $213,000 in system development fees alone. The proposed system development fee methodology uh, for certain rental projects uh, with a commercial rate, and that's for projects that are three or more and would depend upon the, the size of the meter required and, and conditions that I'll get to in a moment, um, under such a methodology, a theoretical 20 unit apartment building that was using a two inch meter, and I, of course that may vary uh, according to the number of fixtures and other factors of the development, but it would incur approximately $97,000 $97, in system development fees or reduction of approximately $115,000 for the project. So the conditions for eligibility for um, getting those commercial fees um, we've got six of them that were, were thrown out there. The one, the size of the meter would be determined uh, by a calculation sheet provided by the city. It would be consistent with that which is already being used by Buena Vista, which would be helpful for the development uh, community to have a singular uh, calculation to use throughout the entire county um, with the majority of the development going on. Uh, the rental development w could take on a variety of forms. Uh, we have a lot of different rental projects out there, some that are all attached, some that are detached, um, but it must be located on a single lot and under single ownership. If any of the individual units were to ever convert to a separate ownership property via subdiv uh, subdiv uh, subdivision excuse me, or condominiumization, then the applicant would be responsible for paying the difference between what was already paid on a per unit basis for those commercial fees and the system development fee for um, a non-rental unit ap applicable at the time of the conversion. So they make up that difference. The development uh, must include a minimum of three units. That's how we currently define multifamily in the code as it is. Um, the number of residential units in the development must be equal to or greater than 50% of the maximum number of units allowed per density. Um, and, you know, consistent with a comprehensive plan, uh, those developments would be encouraged to strive towards maximum density as appropriate. And then lastly, uh, individual units may not exceed 1,200 square feet excluding garage space. So that would preclude, um, you know, the construction of these luxury, luxury apartment units of 2,000 square feet or more, create a greater sense of um, efficiency in various ways. This is the fee sheet as it would be updated with the, the notes calling out those specific conditions. Um, hard to see, but the commercial fees are all off on the right-hand side of that particular table. All right, with that, I'd love to take your questions. input. Mr. Mayor. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the, uh, about a year back or so, um, I kind of had the, a similar idea when it came to ADUs, um, you know, had, if it was an ADU was put up in, you know, for affordable rental, you know, we can cut a break for that sort of thing, that kind of program. And I remember bringing it up to um, Becky Gray and the, and the big um, kind of concern was how would we track that? How would we ensure that those remained rentals and that it remained, you know, as such? Um, so I guess my question, considering this seems similar, is how do we ensure that, how do we, how do we keep track of that? Sure. Well, in the case of the ADUs, of course, they are actually charged at the same level as an affordable housing unit uh, at 40 percent of what single family is. And ADUs are actually not allowed to be sold as well. So, I mean, it's pretty, pretty easy there um, as far as maintaining that that accountability and all um, in this particular case uh, there. Of course, it would depend on the level of review coming in to determine um, whether or not it got the approval, but those conditions certainly could be built into the particular 
approval, whether it's at an administrative level or up at city council um, for all of these particular conditions. Um, I mean, a lot of them are, are built into the development itself as opposed to the rent. And really, the, the point here is not to address um, affordable rent levels, but really to work with the market in a way to create the supply that will help bring those market rental rates down. So we're not tracking that rental price as much as just the rental. Correct. Now, of course, they do have the option to provide some affordable, um, big A affordable units to um, as part of the inclusionary housing. But um, that would that be a separate issue, of course, than really what we're talking about here. Anybody else? Any other question? Yeah. So how will this uh, affect the budget, the community development budget? Um, It's more, it's really uh, tied to the water and wastewater fund. uh, And um, it certainly will have an impact, uh, no doubt, uh, if provided that those units actually get built. And um, so there'll be a, a bit of a draw, if you will, on that particular fund uh, for each of these units that get built down the line. That said, um, we'll have more information soon coming forth as the rate study for mailers uh, comes to you all to, to identify you know, where we are as far as setting ourselves up for a, a healthy fund in the future. Um, and you all have the ability to um, make some adjustments you know, to the rates um, for other groups and including the commercial groups as well uh, to help ensure that there is a healthy fund in the future but there, there's that flexibility in there um, but certainly every unit under this particular proposal that got gets developed will be a, a draw overall mm-hmm. but of course that's balanced against the need for housing at this point right yeah. so so also then there would be the opportunity in a few years to do another rate study and see how that see whether this if we make this change, what impact it's had and how, if we need to correct at that time? Sure, or if not earlier. I mean, honestly, if you end up seeing the type of um, construction uh, that we're all looking for and we get closer to meeting the, those particular needs, specifically within the rental market, you always have an option to be able to tweak things at that point as well. Good, thanks. Yeah. Anybody else? No. Yeah, I just wanted to Bill, say that would, this is an investment in the community. Um, and in terms of the funding, obviously the water, wastewater fund has to be able to carry the freight. The mix of the various housing types and commercial and so forth is always a factor. So if we keep this outside and it's flexible and dynamic, then we can make sure that the fund stays above water um, and that we invest in the community. So I think good, good concerns to bring up. Yep. All right, very good. Mike? I was just going to say, um, yeah, I, people have been talking about higher density, you know, multi, more multifamily, and these, the hurdles that this kind of solves for people to build more, um, more density um, in their projects is it's great, I think. Um, people have been talking about it a long time. We've just not done a lot of multifamily um, building, and it's kind of hurting us now. We just don't have the uh, supply of housing partly as a result, you know, uh, not as many apartments as we need. And the 1,200, it seems like a good cap um, square feet. It's not too big, you know, not too small. So, uh, yeah, I'm really for that. Yeah. Okay. Great. <clears throat> All right. Yeah, I, I support that proposal as well. Um, my question is, uh, is that affecting the monthly fees like if if developers take an opportunity of this um when you have a commercial cap license um how how does that figure into the the monthly charges I don't yeah think i'm that, not sure i'm not sure that i understand the question harold so basically the difference between um <clears throat> the, we charge on based on use for the serv- monthly service fees so this doesn't necessarily impact that okay. in terms of the monthly service charges because we base you know based on a per gallon usage rate. Yeah. So uh, if if we change uh, this particular component, it's really just focused on the actual serv- system development fee or tap fee. Mm-hmm. So the basically the ability to tap into the system. That's all this is really affecting. In that. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Very good. 
All right, and we got, we're down to 15 minutes. Are there any kind of last minute questions on this stuff? Nope. All right, yeah, I think it, it seems to make sense. So it looks pretty good. I, right. that's Thank you. I'm getting. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna move the short term rental discussion to the end. We may or may not get to that. And it's, uh, while a very important issue, it's not the most pressing thing we're dealing with right now. So let's talk about the financial contributions for affordable housing. So you have a memo in your packet uh, along with a letter from Chapey County Community Foundation. Uh, we've been in discussions with uh, both them and with the Chafee Housing Authority with regard to contributions related to Jane's Place. Um, as you know, you approved that at your uh, meeting back, uh, I think, 1st of June, uh, that particular project. And there are still some gaps, I think, in the overall structure for funding for the project that are kind of laid out in the, the memo that I put together, as well as the one that Joseph had provided. So um, in, in terms of what we're looking at here, there's kind of an immediate ask, and then there's a, a follow-up ask that comes somewhere down the road. <laughs> and not sure exactly when we're going to get to that follow-up ask, but it's coming pretty fast. Uh, the immediate ask is for $50,000 in funding for pre-development costs. And um, we view that as a very small investment in what I think is going to be a really transformative project for people that are in these, uh, these transitions um, in housing uh, for, for rehousing purposes, for uh, emergency needs, as well as for seasonal workers that we have coming through town. You guys have seen the project, so I don't need to resell it to you. Um, the, the second ask is a little bit more sizable in nature, but again, I, my, my impression is that it's a good investment uh, in terms of the total number of units that would be added that have some affordability to them uh, for people that are coming into and out of our community. And I, I guess at this point, I'd, if, if you all want to add any color to that, um, I think it would be uh, appropriate at this point just to kind of talk about where you see um, this this ask coming from, where it's going to, and then at, at twenty grand a unit, you know, for for the city's investment in that is it's actually relatively inexpensive to see these units come online. So that's my color commentary, and I'll let <laughs> Joseph add anything else he wants to to it. No, uh, thank you, Administrator Nelson. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor, Council Members. Thank you all for your time here tonight uh, and for considering this request. I think um, Administrator Nelson really laid it out very well. Uh, we're coming to you with what we think is a substantial ask in total um, in two parts, pre-development and then later to be built in hopefully to the development agreement. Um, and really the bottom line here is that this is a community project. Uh, it's by the community, it's for the community. As you all know from previous discussions, this project was designed with heavy input from our nonprofit and community partners. Um, we also are relying on community to pay for it. As you all know, there's restrictions that come with traditional housing subsidy dollars. We're hoping to avoid those in order to keep the project flexible to serve this community. And so that's really the bottom line of this request, is saying the community has already uh, committed a substantial number of dollars. We have more than 55 or 60 donors at this point that have committed over $310,000. And those are almost all Slida residents. Um, and we plan to keep on going. And so we know that this commitment from the city of Salida would be a demonstration, a matching contribution to what community is already putting forward for this project. So I'll free, I'm happy to answer any questions if you have them. Otherwise, thank right. you. Questions? Yeah, Jane. What exactly is pre-development? Short answer. And what's your total budget for it? Yes, so um, pre-development would cover everything from uh, acquisition to design to permit fees um, including RFP processes for selecting contractors, everything it's going to take to get us a shovel in the ground. Um, so that entire budget uh, is probably around um, 400000 Please don't quote me on that exact number, <laughs> but it's right around there. Um, and so, as I mentioned, we've raised $310,000 uh, $310, to date. Um, so this contribution of 50000 would put us within that margin of error for our pre-development costs. And part of those pre-development costs will also be um, those uh, uh, fees from the city, part of the per permit process, that will be part of our future conversations, I'm sure. So um, that's the basis. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? 
I think the only commentary I would add actually is that we talked about this as part of a potential challenge opportunity as well back to the community that right. if the community was able to raise the additional $40,000 to match this kind of 350 number that unlocks that that 300,000 from the city. So it's a really again just putting it back out there to the community to say there's really some positive investment here that you get return on your dollars for everything, you know, everyone that you put gets matched by the city up to this certain point. So that's kind of the way we approached it from the conversations that we had internally with, with the community foundation. Absolutely. Any other, anything else? Um, I'm for it. <laughs> yeah, excellent. Yeah. And I will say, um, the, uh, between some of the, uh, rescue plan money um, and excess taxes that we've collected this year i i think it's something that we can do and i think certainly attacking these type of housing projects has been one of our main missions so i think it's a um, a worthwhile thing i guess the the question would be does this just come back to us as a budget amendment uh, question or how does that get funded? So tonight you have a question before you in your regular meeting with regard to the pre-development cost component. Right. Um, eventually, if you do approve a, a larger expenditure, we probably would bring that back to you as a budget amendment. Um, I don't view that as, as outside the realm of possibility. And, and I think in, in terms of this year when we see uh, sales tax that's uh, increased at a greater level than what we anticipated, there, that provides some opportunity in there, so the revenue side needs to kind of be changed as well when we're looking at the full snapshot of the picture. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. All right. Um, Mr. Mayor? Yes. Yeah, I just wanted to make one comment. I finally was able to unmute. Um, <laughs> we had a really good experience and a really good outcome with the foundation when we did the COVID match. So, um, I mean, I'm a big supporter. Absolutely. Um, very true. That turned out to be a pretty amazing uh, uh, moment in Salida history with yeah. that match and the amount of money we, um, you guys were able to raise for the community. Absolutely. It was pretty, pretty impressive. Absolutely. Thank you all very much. All right. Great. Um, wow. And we still have like 10 minutes to talk about short-term rentals. <laughs> I think I'll recuse myself <laughs> from that discussion as well, so I'll keep it even shorter. <laughs> Um, yeah is there is there money we have a affordable housing fund i forget what we call it or is it inclusionary housing fund we do have an affordable housing fund and it's got i believe about ninety thousand dollars in it right now a little over a hundred excuse me over um but that fund is kind of weird because it's one time dollars so you typically don't want it to to be used for kind of ongoing expenses so we have to be careful and think um you know about this we get one shot to use it, basically. It doesn't get replenished by the same unit over and over again like uh, like a sales tax dollar would as it comes in. So yep. just something to kind of theorize about. Yep. Okay, great. Um, let's do the short-term rentals quick. Nina? Yes, I was made for this moment to talk fast, just kidding. Um, so as we know, um, Bill's been t working on brainstorming, presenting options to address the recent housing crisis. Um, there's many tools in this toolbox, so we are just keep bringing these to you because we know this is an important goal to you, to you uh, given the um, true emergency in our region. One idea is to look at short-term rentals and their impact on the housing market and affordability. And specifically, I'll go into the research, but what we're asking um, today is for guidance of considering a moratorium or a temporary halt on um, all new licenses for a in the next six to nine months, that's an example. Um, given this type of measure and the potential implications of, you know, once that's announced, uh, and when a governing board ever considers a moratorium, it's done usually very quickly and done via emergency ordinance. So we would, if we got your guidance, bring it back to the next council meeting um, for, again, emergency ordinance. And again, that would be just something that's very temporary. The memo in your packet establishes the research that it's clear a significant correlation between how many short-term rentals units are in a, in a community and that impact or decrease of affordability in available housing stock. And it also talks about the effect of inequity, um, equity issues. And particularly important in this memo or the research that we put together is the Summit County Housing Needs Update, um, the Northwest COG 2021 Mountain Migration Report, and then the specific recent data in Salida. 
So um, consider, I'm going to assume, if you ask any questions, I'm going to assume everyone read the memo, but mostly we're looking for a direction if we're bringing back this emergency or ordinance establishing a moratorium on all new short-term rental licenses. Okay. Questions, thoughts, input? I mean, it makes a lot of sense to me. You know, the, I mean, people have been complaining about short-term rentals, um, you know, with the exception of one population. Everyone else complains about it. Um, and with the numbers and statistics that we're looking at, it seems prudent to do a moratorium. Mr. Mayor? Yes. Yeah, I would just say extraordinary times require extraordinary, extraordinary measures, and I think we need to take a look at this because uh, we are in complete crisis. Um, you know, and this is just in the commercial, and this, and I think I had talked with uh, Drew and Nina about this a little bit. So, you know, we already limit these in the residential zones, so it only apply, and we don't have any open licenses in the residential zones. Um, it would only apply to those commercial districts, and so kind of the question winds up. Well, it would PDs apply and, to all and PDs of, and new, and, like there's some planned developments, right? Some of the planned developments yeah. and the new, um, where, where there are available licenses, um, and so I guess my my only my biggest concern was okay. Well, this is a commercial business in a commercial zone, and we're going to shut that down, um, and then we also are a tourist town like it or not and that is how people like to vacation i would much rather stay in a house than a hotel if i can um, so just some concerns i don't think it's a super simple cut and dry um, discussion and there's there are issues to be weighed on both sides of that so i just want to make sure that you guys are thinking about those things so is the idea that we would do a moratorium and come back to this issue after whatever length of time we, six it's, months? It's required in order to have a moratorium in the first place is that you have to come back and I'm. <laughs> go on. I am so Explain sorry. Explain about moratoriums. So, <laughs> no, go please, on. Finish. Go no, ahead. We have no time. Go, go. See, I knew I'd mess that one up. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Go um, the, the whole point is to come back and address it during that, t during that time oh, period during is so that you're cultivating, you're gathering data. Right you're analyzing the situation and then you're coming up with some solutions to handle those those challenges or the issues that you have therein. Because the only uh, in, in, in instances where you're are legally al allowed to kind of do or permitted um, or that's it's been allowed to pass muster to do a moratorium is when there is a certain situation that needs to be um, ad either addressed or, or, or stopped for a short period of time while you look into the issue. That's the purpose of a moratorium. Right. And, and we do believe that there's, I mean, if you read the mountain migration report, you can see in there that there's some pretty s significant components to this that we need to kind of kick the tires on, specifically this, the separation of taxation between residential and commercial uses, which are, com you know, compromised in the state of Colorado anyways with what we've done over the past right. however many years with the Gallagher Amendment and all this other crazy stuff, right? So we need to, to see if there's actually structural changes that might happen at the state level or other things that, that were recommended in that report that we can then use as um, things to push forward as, as policies here in Salida. Right, yep. and there, um, again, the, the amount of things that are gonna need to be balanced in this question, mm -hmm. and certainly if you are running a commercial business in the commercial place, it'd be great if you played, paid commercial taxes. And I'm sure our <laughs> lodging partners that run hotels that pay those taxes would appreciate that. Is there a mechanism to do that? Don't know. Um, if you're building a house specifically to use it as a short-term rental, and that's a commercial business, should you pay a commercial tap fee? Um, you know, that's, there's a lot of complexity here, and it may take us, uh, you know, six, nine months to work through that complexity. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the other question is, are we are we saving enough whatever we're trying to save right. during that moratorium to make it worth doing the moratorium and not just doing the research? Yeah. So you guys work that question. out. Yeah. Uh, just <laughs> <throwing> out questions. 
Uh, and I, I'm going to put a quick plug in, too, for one of the other programs that we're looking at doing as part of these series of housing emergency measures that uh, whether this goes through or not, to try to um, help incentivize folks who have short-term rentals or uh, just second vacation homes of their own, and even potentially just a whole bunch of extra space in their own home that they have as a primary residence to convert those to long-term rentals. And so we're looking at putting something together that um, will go out and uh, try to bring those folks into the mix so we have some more more roofs over people's heads. Okay. And I'll, I'll, I'll uh, cop to not, I forgot to add that in, the plug for this other program that we're starting to look at. Bill and I were talking before about this, and I just failed to remember to mention yep. that part. All right. All right. Great. Well, i um, not sure we have to really come to any conclusions around that right now. You have uh, some time during our meeting to mull that over. You may want to um, in your comments, if you have some strong opinions about that, you might want to throw those in. Yeah, give us direction, um, yeah. Yep. Otherwise, we'll, uh, um, if we don't hear anything significant, then we can revisit this at our next meeting and give staff direction, if that sounds reasonable. All right, 6.33, we should start our other meeting. <laughs> <It's time. laughs> Let's take a quick, just couple minutes here, and then we'll get right into that one. Do we need to switch the? We do need to switch the go to go to webinar. Okay. So, sorry, those of you that are come, showing up for our regular meeting, we're work session running just a hair late, so we'll get right to it. I think you did great getting us through all that. <laughs> that was wild. It was pretty cool. I had my doubts, but you know, <laughs> it actually worked out. Fired right through. Yeah. Got a lot done, too, I think. Yeah, yeah. Anybody feeling especially enthusiastic? Welcome to the webinar. You, you have entered as an you? organizer I'll and may now speak with other organizers okay. or panelists on the line. When you are ready for your attendees to hear you, press the start broadcast Some button expression. on the go to webinar <laughs> control panel. Yeah, like I guess. <laughs> you should make it sound like I'm in The broadcast spirits. is now starting. Yeah. All attendees are in listen only <laughs> mode. Civility spirit. <laughs> A few ohms to start. <laughs> Just make sure we got everybody. Looks like Harold hasn't made it back in yet, so we'll give him just another minute. So. <clears throat> Looks like we got everybody back, uh, yeah, except for yeah, Nina, but she'll... Sorry, I'm technical. I'm trying to get in. Okay. Oh, there she is. Don't want to do this without our, without our attorney <laughs> present. All right, join me in the pledge, please. I pledge, pledge allegiance to, to the flag, flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and to the republic, republic for which it stands, stands one nation, nation under, under God, God and uh, roll call. Critelli? Sorry. Present. Casper? <coughs> Here. Pappenfort? Present. Shore? Here. Pollock? Here. Templeton? Present. Mary P.T. Wood? Present. A quorum is present. 
All right, and I believe uh, Councillor Critelli has the civility invocation this evening. We are here working together to create a thriving community. It is the intention of the Salida City Council to promote civil communication by adopting the following guidelines for speaking to the public in the City Council Chambers. It is our hope that by acting in this manner, we can help create a safe space for people to share their perspectives and opinions. We honor the opportunity to be engaged in the process of governance for the benefit of our community. We acknowledge that each of us brings a unique perspective to this conversation and that our perspectives may differ. We challenge ourselves to value varying points of view and hold all contributions as equally important. We understand and accept that while we may sometimes disagree, we can always be courteous and kind. We commit to respectful language, avoiding rumor, harsh criticism, or personal accusation, even when feeling emotionally charged. We will, to the best of our ability, speak thoughtfully and listen with attention, respect, and curiosity. We are confident that there may be even better solutions that any of us have thought of, which may be discovered through civil conversations. We commit to the city of Salida being a hate-free zone and declare and affirm a policy of non-discrimination on the basis of a person's race, color, religion, ancestry, national origin, age, sexual orientation, gender, gender identity, marital status, military or veteran status, socioeconomic class, medical condition, or physical or mental disability. Thank you. Uh, consent agenda, anything on there that we need to discuss or? Um, quick question about the um, Slider like Arts Festival. I, I think there was something about the porta potties in there that looked like uh, it didn't quite add up to the numbers they were expecting, or maybe they did. Um, the two in the, it, it, I guess, is there enough porta potties for the for the Salida Arts Festival? Because they kind of cited two at the boat ramp in this mm -hmm. on page ten. Mm -hmm. I was just trying to figure out the math there. But. Um. Diesel. <laughs> we we've been dealing with we've been dealing with some bathroom issues lately, and that includes uh, some restroom permanent restroom facilities that have been closed. So, I'll. Sorry, I'm trying to get to the agenda, um, so that I can see exactly what we're we're. I'm assuming, Sarah, this is in the application. It is. For, okay. Yeah. There it is. It's on page yeah. ten of the packet, right, right there, right there, right there. Last paragraph. Okay, um, I I am sure that they are speaking of the two bathrooms that are at the boat ramp, not porta potties. Oh, okay. Um, the, but those have recently been closed, mm -hmm. so this would be a situation where I would be reaching out to them and seeing. We basically are trying to adopt a policy right now that if we close a permanent bathroom, we put a temporary bathroom in. Um, so if those bathrooms are closed, we will have porta potties there. Uh, I know Fibark had as many as eight over on the boat ramp. Um, so we're not we're certainly not opposed to that uh Fibark was different in that they asked for that area to be closed so i don't see that request here um, the boat ramp area to be closed mm -hmm. yeah um so uh i can clarify with them that they're speaking of the permanent bathrooms okay and if they are make sure that there are porta potties if they need them so thanks to you great yeah thanks yes. all right any Anything else on the consent agenda? Motion to combine and approve, perhaps? Mr. Mayor, I move to combine and approve the consent agenda. Second. All right, we got a motion and a second. The motion is to combine and approve consent agenda. Any other discussion on that? Uh, Pollock? Yes. Critelli? Yes. Shore? Yes. Casper? Yes. Pattenfort? Yes. Templeton? Yes. Motion passed. All right, excellent. Uh, citizen comment, do you have anybody signed up there? Uh, Adam Martinez. Yeah. 
Yes, hi, good evening. Um, I um, wanted to tell, let you know about this. I was in downtown on June 18th, and I was adjacent to my mom's shop. I, I parked right in the park, and as I was going down, I was halfway down right by uh, where the old Sunshine Market used to be and Pinion Real Estate, and I had seen a woman fall and land in the barricades. I asked her at that point if she was all right, and somebody said that um, a family member was going to take her to the hospital to get medical care, and I couldn't reach Her Harold, and by the time City I got down to City Hall, it was closed, so I let Dan's wife know, and in essence, and the thing of it is, is um, I think having the streets blocked off is an endangerment to the citizens of this town because, in essence, that is a liability issue, and you've got everything spaced out to where it could it, it could be, and it's a potential, in essence, hazard. And Dan uh, 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 told me, in essence, well, what if we opened up the streets back up? and somebody else could church. Well, that's not the point. You guys chose to block the streets off, and you guys chose to do this and chose to do that. And in essence, and then Harold told me something to the effect, what if somebody, what if a car would have hit that woman, uh, uh, oh, that, uh, that poor old woman, and s something must have happened to her, which in essence doesn't help the situation. And my thing of it is, is, what happens if somebody else falls and somebody else falls? Do we then say again, well, it's not a liability issue and and in essence and say and make excuses? Um, the thing of it is, is it's a, it's a real problem and I think that you guys need to assess the situation and learn from what happened and learn from our mistakes to where it doesn't happen again and um, and I was going to ask uh, the city attorney a question regarding uh, Mrs. Adelman. Do you know, know how long condemnation takes of the house? And in essence, guys, you know I support you in anything you do, but I think that we need to reevaluate this situation. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. And I'll take the, uh, this tonight. Um, I, you're un, you're concerned about the safety with the barricades down at the closure and would like right. us to take a look at that and then uh, some concerns about the length of time that the condemnation is taking at the Edelman property okay thanks Adam um, let's see uh, Rob Gartsman hi everyone Rob Gartsman citizen of Salida and business owner here with Sweeties and the Biker and the Baker. Um, I'd first like to say thank you to all of you guys um, work really hard to help make this city a great place and a great place to live and a great community to be a part of. And I am a proud citizen of Salida. I work hard every day to be a part of this community. But we are faced with a really big problem here and I'm here tonight to discuss affordable housing. I know as a city we've been talking about this for like six years and maybe having meaningful conversations. Um, and uh, a lot of things have happened as a result of those conversations, including earlier tonight, I understand um, some things going to Jane's place. But uh, in the end, we still need a lot more housing. Uh, we are faced with a really big problem and an urgency um, has been uh, exasperated by the pandemic and the rising housing prices. I know there are a couple action items uh, later today on uh, the agenda regarding affordable housing, and I'm here as a concerned citizen and a small business owner who realizes that our town is 100% dependent on service industry employees. Our wonderful city makes the majority of its money off tourism through sales tax revenue and commercial property taxes, and just about every business in this town needs employees to keep operating. It's really nice for all the business owners and property owners in our town to see the value of their homes and businesses and property skyrocket over the last decade. 
but as the value is also dependent on all the services that the small businesses bring to this town. We are facing a critical shortage of employees across the board, mostly due to a lack of reasonably priced housing. I'm close with many business owners in this town and most restaurant owners and speaking with all of them, we are tired. We are happy to work hard and pay reasonable wages, much higher than other locations across the country, but even still we deal with the same problems over and over. And the biggest issue that many of these people who would like to move here and work for us is that they can't find places to live affordably right. off the wages we have. Um, many businesses and restaurants have started to limit their hours and soon it won't be worth it for them and others will start to close. And I see this happening like within the year. Uh, number of places are probably going to close um, and as a town I'm not sure if we're prepared for that it's a snowball effect with fewer businesses in town won't be quite as special as it is now and the, um, this will impact our tourism and locals alike and the services the town can offer that being said the city and the county can do something about it but we need to act as quickly as possible as a business owner when we are faced with major issues we pool all of our assets and use them as leverage to address our problems just so happens that the city of Salida is the largest landowner within the city limits. And we have the ability to address this problem. Salida is not going to stay small forever. I know a lot of us wish that it would, and that's a double edged sword, but um, the cat's out of the bag. People found us. Um, and uh, I'm asking the city to do what it takes to address this problem. I know, like I said, we have a lot of small things going on, but we need big, like something bigger. Um, there are a lot of ways to temporarily fix this problem, but in the end, the only way to truly address this problem is to build a lot of units that are affordable. So please, I ask you guys to do what it takes. Thank you so much. I appreciate you all. Yep. So, and so, Rob, by hearing you uh, reiterating the uh, seriousness of our affordable housing uh, problem and uh, imploring us to do everything we can. Absolutely. All right. Thank you. All right, that's who I have on my list. Am I missing anybody? See hands raised or anybody else? Okay, we'll go ahead and close the public comment and <coughs> move on to unfinished business. And we'll, let's see, let's start with Ordinance 202109, an ordinance of the City of Salida, Colorado. Uh, rezoning certain real property known as 900 J Street from commercial to manufactured housing residential R4. This is uh, a second reading and a public hearing. Yep. So I was just going to say that. <laughs> so tonight is second reading public hearing for Ordinance 202109 for the rezoning of the property located at 900 J Street. Um, from commercial to manufactured residential, manufactured housing residential. The applicant is Landon V. Hill, and I believe she's online if you have any questions of her. Nothing has changed since first reading. Staff has recommended City Council approve the major impact review application to rezone the property from commercial to R4. And I can answer any questions if you have them. Okay, great. Anybody have any questions? Just one. Do do it. Does the owner have any any idea how many units she'll be able to put on that property, or he will? <laughs> I believe she wants. She's trying to do eight more units. Good. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions for staff right now, or for the applicant? All right. Let's go ahead and open the public hearing. Then, do we have anybody signed up for for that? All right. I don't see her on them. Yeah, I don't see her <clears> online. <throat> I, don't see her on I don't see her on online either. Unless they're listed as Mark Lee. <laughs> um, all right. Don't have anybody. All right, we'll go ahead and close the public hearing on that then and move on to uh, council discussion. Um, anything anybody has on that or a motion or? Mr. Mayor, I move to approve Ordinance 2021-09 on second reading. Second. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. The motion is to approve Ordinance 2021-09 uh, on second reading. Uh, any other discussion on that? Sarah. Templeton? Yes. Shore? Yes. Pollock? 
Yes. Papenfort? Yes. Cotelli? Yes. Casper? Yes. The motion passed. All right, excellent. Well, hopefully um, we just took another step in the direction that Mr. Gartsman asked us to. <laughs> um, certainly sounds like we'll be increasing the housing stock anyways. Uh, ordinance 202110, um, an ordinance of the City Council for the City of Salida, amending Section 16. 1340 of the Salida Municipal Code concerning in lieu fees uh, chosen as an option to satisfy the inclusionary housing requirements. Uh, this is also a second reading and public hearing. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, yes, and also uh, related to affordable housing. So this particular ordinance would move the language in regards to the inclusionary housing in lieu fee from the land use code and put it directly into the city's fee schedule. Um, as the packet discusses, there's been a considerable change in the affordability gap since the in lieu fee was uh, initiated in 2018. And uh, we have a resolution later this evening to discuss the, um, the specifics of those changes. But this particular, particular ordinance would simply move it from the land use code into uh, the fee schedule. Um, so uh, with that, I, I would certainly uh, recommend the motion uh, to you all to approve the ordinance and, and available for any questions you may have. Right. Questions for staff? Anybody? All right, well, why don't we go ahead and open the public hearing. Do we have anybody signed up to talk about this? Nope. All right, did anybody forget to sign up? Okay, and I don't see any hands raised on the interweb, so we will go ahead and close the public hearing on that and move on to council discussion. Discussion, motions, thoughts? Mr. Mayor, I move to approve ordinance 2021-10 on second reading. Second. All right, we have a motion to second. The motion is to approve ordinance 2021-10 on second reading. Discussion? None. I, I will add uh, that I think this is really important to actually move this out of the ordinance and into the fee, fee schedule where we have a lot more flexibility to either raise or lower that fee without going through the whole ordinance process. So it does make a lot of sense. Good, yeah. Yeah. I, want to, I want to thank Planning Commission for uh, pushing this forth as well. Yeah. Um, Sarah. Sure. Yes. Pappenfort? Yes. Pollock? Yes. Templeton? Yes. Casper? Yes. Critelli? Yes. Motion passed. All right, excellent. Moving right along, uh, let's see, new business. So we'll start with resolution 2021-21, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Salida, Colorado, approving a coordinated mail ballot election and adopting the uniform election code. Who gets this one? <laughs> I thought you were doing it. <laughs> what? She's in the Bahamas. Actually. She's totally in the Bahamas. <laughs> Don't look on social media and see the pictures. Yeah, <laughs> she keeps sending all these pictures of beach and sun. And no, stop doing that. <laughs> Do you want to take it, Nina? Since okay. Yeah. So every um, election we have, we, if we have the opportunity, if there's a election going on with the county, to be coordinated with them. It makes sense for logistical reasons. It saves you costs. It's what you've done the past many elections. So um, this is just to for you to approve um, that coordinated mail ballot election. There are certain um, deadlines that need to be met for um, this upcoming election in November, certain dates in the state statute. So um, that is a very brief explanation um, that this is just kind of the elections that you're used to having where the county is, is coordinated. You'll get one ballot and it has everything that's the county and the city. Great. Any questions? Motion? 
Mr. Mayor, I move to approve resolution 2021-21, approving a coordinated mail ballot election and adopting the uniform election code. Second. Second. Can I just add while you guys are, um, it, we also wrote here that you'll be approving the inter, the IGA that will come from this for these purposes. So you don't have to, it doesn't have to come back to you again. Okay. So we have a motion and a second. The motion is to approve uh, resolution 2021, a resolution of the city council of the city of Salida, Colorado, approving a coordinated mail ballot election and adopting the uniform election code. Um, discussion? Pollock? Yes. Casper? Yes. Critelli? Yes. Shore? Shore? Templeton? Yes. Paffinfort? Yes. Dan's still trying to unmute or something there. Can just raise your hand there, Dan, if you're. Oh. There you go. Can I hear you? Yes? He is self muted now. Now you're, you've muted yourself, Dan. <laughs> Unmuted. Yes. <laughs> Can't hear me? Yes. <laughs> the motion passed. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. All right. Uh, all right. That will bring us to resolution 2021 23, approving development improvements agreement, uh, subdivision improvement. What? Twenty-two. Oh, twenty-two. <laughs> <laughs> trying to avoid the fee schedule. Apparently. <laughs> <Super fun. laughs> uh, resolution twenty twenty one twenty two, a resolution of the City Council for the City of Salida, Colorado, amending the twenty twenty one fee schedule. All right. So uh, this is kind of the um, add on to the ordinance that recently just passed in regards to moving the fee schedule um, for in, or in lieu fee calculations rather from the land use code over to the city's fee schedule. Um, one of the other requests on the part of planning commission was to update the fees in lieu for inclusionary housing um, based on the affordability gap. The affordability gap is that which is uh, the gap between market rate homes, the, the median uh, price for homes and affordable units um, as described in the inclusionary housing policy for a uh, four person household making 80% AMI. In 2018, when the inclusionary ha housing ordinance first passed, the median market rate was $365,000, give or take. Um, the market, or sorry, the affordable rate for a four-person household was calculated at approximately 235000 Obviously, over the last few years, we've seen some skyrocketing prices. Uh, the median market rate for homes in Chafee County as of May of this year is now $505,000, so an increase of approximately $140,000. Um, <clears> so... I looked at the calculations that we had uh, to identify the fees in lieu and, and noticed a few other things that needed to be updated. And uh, Sarah, if you wouldn't mind scrolling down, I would like to get to the calculations sheet. Oh, and it's going to be below all of these, uh, all the fee schedule. Oh, okay. And actually, I'm sorry, it's on the, it's in the, the PowerPoint. I think the one slide I sent. Well, let's let's just keep going through here. I'm sorry. It's gonna be easier <laughs> to bring it up right here if we go to the bottom of this one. I can okay. Page twenty oh twenty eight of thirty. Mm -hmm. Just gonna be a little bit easier to explain things, I think, off of the calculation sheet. Uh, right, yep, yeah. you're right there. I'm sorry it's off a little bit off the page. Um, but basically, this is the calculation sheet that was uh, initially used to come up with our fees in lieu. And again, the fees in lieu are only um, paid for those uh, plan developments, annexations, ma major subdivisions, condo plats of five or more, that, um, and minor subdivisions that are not providing actual affordable units. And as you can see here, um, the, the prices for the 
market median home value and uh, have, have gone up considerably, whereas the affordable home price for a family of four has only marginally risen. And part of that rise, actually, I took out of the, out of the initial calculation um, a $250 or so um, add-on per month that addressed fees that are not really captured within the median market value. So it wasn't really totally an apples to apples comparison. Um, I think to, to make it a little, to um, align a little bit better, I took that out. So that bumped that number up a little bit. Um, however, the per square foot uh, price for the in lieu fee was based off of um, an, an average home size of approximately 2,000 square feet. I went back into the data to look at um, the square footage of the homes that have been approved over the last couple of years, as well as those that have been sold um, over the last couple of years, and they both actually equated to right around 1,650 square feet. So in other words, we kind of were over guessing the, the size of the median home and therefore sort of in some ways under charging on a per square foot basis. On top of that, we had, we capped everything at 2,000 square feet. So anybody building something over 2,000 square feet was not paying a, an in lieu fee um, on those additional square feet, which if you think about it, um, anything over, 2,000 square feet or 1,650 square feet in this particular case is more than likely going to be a more expensive unit anyways, and it's going to be contributing to the affordability gap. So no reason to, to cap it um, beyond the 1,650 square foot median that uh, is established here. Now, through all those changes, the rise of the median market value, the reduction in the median uh, square footage per unit, the result uh, is a just over a doubling of the per square foot cost for the in lieu fee. So it was seven dollars and eighty seven cents. This would bump it up to sixteen dollars and fifty one cents. Minor subdivisions do receive a discount of fifty percent on a per square per square foot basis. Um, so those would still be in the eight dollars and twenty five cent realm. Um, so it does change it considerably. The calculations below, um, there, there's a, <clears throat> uh, a calculation formula that um, does show the reduction in the in lieu fees on a per unit basis that would need to be paid if a larger subdivision or development did provide a portion of the overall number of affordable units. Um, that were required, that 12.5%. So that, that's what that, that formula and that uh, particular table shows, is that the more units that are actually provided, physically provided, um, the greater savings, if you will, of the inclusionary housing fees in lieu. Um, but it, it's a little bit of a, a calculated formula, formula but um, with this, we can just kind of plug and play um, when it comes to identifying those, those actual fees. Now, one of the additional proposals uh, as part of this resolution however um, currently rental units are included just the same as any other unit um, that would be out there single family or otherwise so today uh, anything that came in let's say in a, an apartment building coming into a major subdivision would be charged at that seven dollars and 87 cents per unit um, which can add up quite quickly. I mean, on a, a thousand square foot apartment unit, that's seventy eight hundred and seventy dollars right there per unit in inclusionary housing fees um, for something that's actually probably pretty close to to affordable as far as the the median rents go. So what we did here is we looked at um, rental unit impacts and the uh, potential for um, extending that fee in lieu over a period of 20 years um, and <clears throat> came up with a $3 per square foot uh, basis off of, uh, again, it's, it's based off of the affordability gap between what has been found as the median rent level and what the affordable rent level is per 80% AMI and, and the HUD um, rent levels that we currently have. 
So there is a, there's a, a discount, significant discount that would be built into this particular fee schedule for rental units specifically. Um, so that's that kind of explains uh, a relatively you know, complex <laughs> math, I guess, that goes into it. And I'm happy to um, you know explain anything more that might need to be explained. The uh, the fee sheet, if you wouldn't mind going back up. Um, so then I think it's right above this one really calls out what, Oh, sorry. So that's actually the, that shows the, the rise in home prices, um, here in the County in 2021, it's been a pretty steep increase. And these numbers just to note, take into account the 505,000 median takes into account all single family homes, as well as townhomes and condos that have been sold as we come up with the median that way. And just above this is the actual fee schedule sheet um, that calls out how those fees would be calculated. So uh, with that, um, the recommended motion is to approve the resolution amending the 2020, uh, 2021 fee schedules, and I'm happy to take any questions. Excellent. Great. Questions? Anybody? I don't really have any questions about this. It kind of made sense. I did see that you had the parking uh, fine highlighted in there. Did that get changed or just get highlighted? <laughs> I am not sure. <laughs> it wasn't intended to be okay. talked about at all. Okay. Um, in the, it was in the, directly in the fee schedule itself? Or? Yeah. Mm. Oh, I don't. Okay, so it didn't change. That was my question. Uh, no, I guess. not okay. that I'm aware of. No. All right, very good. I think, I think it looks like, I just did a quick control F, it looks like it's bolding different, um, oh no, it is bolded. I'm not sure why that is. I, was, I thought it was a subtopic, but yeah. Yeah. disregard. Okay. The only relevant piece of the fee schedule is this that's, sheet this right This is here. the only thing that's changing. Yep. Okay. Very good. All right. Anybody? Any, anything? Anybody? Mr. Mayor, I move to approve resolution number 2021-22, uh, amending the 2021 fee schedules. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. And the motion is to approve resolution 2021-22, uh, amending the 2021 fee schedules. Uh, discussion? Sarah. Critelli? Yes. Templeton? Yes. Pavinfort? Yes. Casper? Yes. Pollock? Yes. Shore? Yes. Motion passed. All right, now we can finally get to resolution 2021-23, <laughs> uh, which is the Holman Court Plan Development and Major Subdivision, I believe. Oh, hi, Council. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so this resolution would be to approve uh, really three, three agreements in one. It's the Development Improvement Agreement, Subdivision Agreement, and Inclusionary Housing Agreement for Holman Court Plan Development and Major Subdivision, which you approved uh, back in April. Um, just as a reminder, the uh, Holman Court is actually going to be providing two affordable units as, as part of the development, um, which is actually a little bit greater than the 12 and a half percent that's, that's required. So that's a excellent thing. Um, and uh, they've provided all the required documents at this point and really just kind of looking to uh, prove this agreement and break ground. All right, questions? Mr. Mayor, I move to approve <laughs> resolution 2021-23 to approve the proposed development improvements, subdivision improvements, and inclusionary <clears throat> housing agreement for the Holman Court Plan Development and Major Subdivision. Second. All right, we have a motion to second, and the motion is to approve resolution 2021-23, um, approving the development improvements agreement, subdivision improvements agreement, and inclusionary housing agreement for Holman Court Plan Development and Major Subdivision discussion. Pappenfort? Yes. Critelli? Yes. Shore? Yes. Casper? Yes. Pollock? Yes. Templeton? Yes. Motion passed. All right, excellent. Yep. Chipping away at that affordable <laughs> housing slowly. Um, 
All right, that'll bring us to the declaration <coughs> of extension of state of local emergency uh, and the COVID-19 action plan implementation. Still? 16 <laughs> times. <laughs> 16. It's Bo Jackson's number. It's my, like my favorite baseball number. Yep. Um, Let's stop after that. <laughs> here pretty soon we will not have to do this anymore. I'm really looking forward to that date. And if you all saw, Colorado did finally reach 70% mm -hmm. vaccination rate. So that's a wonderful bit of news for Coloradans. Not so great when compared to some other states where we might have visitors coming from that are dragging uh, variants um, into our community. So we did view this um, through the lens of that with the increased summer visitation and not knowing where folks are coming from that remaining on some level of emergency posture is it makes a lot of sense right now as we continue to deal with the uh, with pandemic response. So with that, we would recommend approval of the extension of the state of emergency to the find the right date August 4th of 2021 which is one day after your first regular city council meeting in August as this is a uh, emergency declaration it does need to be approved by three quarters of the members of the city council and you're only allowed to extend them for 40 days at a time so that's why we have to keep coming back and doing this so with that I'd be happy to answer any questions you have okay, yes um, sorry. I just wanted to make the point that when we went into, officially went into the state of emergency, we adopted a resolution for remote participation. So I just want to um, put in our radar, you know, to be in a work session to establish perhaps a, a, a new remote participation policy that has nothing to do with state of emergencies. Right. So we can just put, keep that on our, our forefront. It looks like it maybe should be at the beginning of August mm -hmm. to discuss that. And, and, I, it, and I have some drafts that we've been doing for other clients if you want to help with that. And we may need to add in there too regarding F Street with closure um, decision-making capabilities right. there too because I believe that that references the emergency declaration when we did that um, a year ago. Yep. Yeah, great. So we can get all that cleaned up next month when we uh, potentially put this all behind us. All right. Uh, questions, discussion, anything on that? Mr. Mayor, I move to approve a declaration of extension of local state of emergency to implement the city of Salida's COVID-19 action plan extending until August 4th, 2021, and we hope for the last time. Yes. <laughs> second. All right. <laughs> motion is second, and the motion is to approve a declaration of extension of local state of emergency to implement the city of Salida's COVID-19 action plan extending until August 4th. 2021 um, discussion. Sarah. Templeton? Yes. Shore? Yes. Pollock? Yes. Critelli? Yes. Paffinfort? Yes. Casper? Yes. Motion passed. Okay. All right, all right, all right. Um, <laughs> Request for funding for Jane's Place. We talked about this at the work session, but who's got this one? Just for brevity's sake, we did talk about this at the work session. These are for pre those pre-development costs we talked about. Um, you know, one thing I noted when Joseph was mentioning the cost, oftentimes you look at just engineering and design costs tend to be about 10% of the total cost of the project. So um, with a $3.4 million project, this is right in line with that. Obviously, they're getting some services that are being contributed um, voluntarily or for free so um, and so as part of that I, I think think that uh, pre-development cost that he provided earlier to you is very appropriate in terms of what we see in the marketplace so with that we do uh, recommend a motion to uh, approve for an additional expenditure uh, to the uh, Chavy County Community Foundation in the amount of fifty thousand dollars for pre-development costs at Jane's place I'd be happy to answer any questions you have okay. questions Anybody? all right I guess um, I guess like a good kind of me messaging that I kind of want to or you know just solidify is that um, projects like this don't exist without community support and this kind of support correct absolutely absolutely okay. for sure um, mr. mayor yes. I move to approve the expenditure of fifty thousand dollars payable to the Chafee County Com Community Foundation to offset pre-development costs for the Jane's Place development. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second, and the motion is to approve an expenditure of 
$50,000 uh, payable to the Chafee County Community Foundation to offset pre-development costs for the Jane's Place development. And I, those are rescue plan dollars? That's where we would recommend that money come from, yes. <coughs> okay. Discussion? The only other thing I would add is I hope we put some um, publicity out there about this move because we want to get even more community support so our monthly newsletter, an article in the paper, whatever we can do. Mm -hmm. Farmer's Pre market. Won't Farmer's spread market. The word. <laughs> <laughs> yep. yep, and this was certainly the, uh, that rescue plan money, um, affordable housing and this type of product, project were things they specifically called out and I think it's a, a great use of those funds. Mm -hmm. Terrific. So anything else? Sarah? Sure. Yes. Pollock? Yes. Pappenfort? Yes. Templeton? Yes. Casper? Yes. Gratelli? Yes. Motion passed. All right, excellent. Man, flying right along. Um, let's go to reports. Let's start with uh, Councilmember Cratelli. Um, n nothing, um, nothing much to uh, report. I guess I, um, I did just want to um, check in on that discussion about um, staffing and uh, shortfalls when it comes to city staff. Um, I think, um, you know, as we are discussing all, you know, more projects happening and, you know, we're, we seem to be a council that's pretty supportive of new projects and thinking big, that re does require that um, aspect of having staff to be able to fuel it, back it up. Um, and um, was talking with council member uh, Templeton just about you know when you think of like a, a, a department like uh, like arts and culture for instance you know is there enough um, you know people behind as big of a culture as we have or the need of that are we meeting that need and um, and uh, so I, I just want to make sure that we're still kind of have that on the on the schedule um, and um, it just makes it easier to approve projects in the future when we know that we have staff to back it up and um, we're not putting too much strain on um, the awesome staff that we have right now. That's all I have. All right, great, thank you. Uh, ooh, how about Council Member Casper? Nothing tonight. Okay. And Council Member Peppenfort. I would say thank you to the um, airport for the great air show and all of the volunteers that participated in that. Um, you know, in spite of uh, weather and some planes not being able to make it in, uh, they still pulled it off. So that was fantastic. And then on a personal note, I'd like to say goodbye to Jim Zizet, whose uh, farewell party was this whole weekend. So he was a, a great businessman, a local character who will be sorely missed. Councilmember Pollock. Oh, just a couple things. Um, I've talked about the prison before, working at the prison. We, we ended masking for um, vaccinated staff today. So as a result of most of the offender population being vaccinated, I forget, what the, it's a very high number, um, and the uh, staff that did I'm walking around without a mask at all. The people who aren't vaccinated have to wear a mask, but it's so great. <laughs> it's just, it's, it feels so good. And the, and the offenders are feeling really great about it too. And they, they really made it possible. Um, uh, I guess, yeah, I, I feel great about tonight because um, a lot of the stuff we have talked about uh, plenty enough that we didn't have any disagreement about it. And that's when we can make, you know, make a lot of progress quickly on uh, <coughs> votes and making decisions. Um, I wanted to point out something about, that I kind of realized about, um, I guess it was Rob's point about, you know, just the crisis of getting workers. We have fewer workers because of the unaffordability or lack of affordable housing um, all over Colorado, but um, it's really uh, critical here. Part of, part of the problem is, is the fewer workers, but part of it is that the people that are coming here are more consumers, in my opinion, of services. So we have increased need for services. 
So that's something I, it kind of dawned on me that I hadn't been thinking about that before, but we, we're, we're, it's two angles that creates the, the crux of the, uh, this kind of pressure. Um, we have a lot of people that don't paint their house. They don't do their own, the work on their cars, let's say. Um, so their service requirement is higher. Um, and that's, that's putting, you know, more pressure on, on workers and people that own businesses to pro provide those services. I mean, I'm, I'm getting people talk, they're calling me about doing work on their house or plumbing, all kinds of things that I used to do. You know, I would run out and do, but I just don't have the energy because they can't, they can't find anybody to do it. And, uh, on the one hand, I feel bad, but on the other hand, I'm glad for these guys that are um, the working class uh, guys. Charge what you need to charge, you know. It's a, it's it's your market, you know. Um, but anyway, uh, that's about it. Um, yeah, it's great to get a lot of things done tonight and uh, keep it simple. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Um, Councilmember Shore. I have nothing tonight. And Councilmember Templeton. Just a couple of things. I want to give a shout out to the trailside residents who, through their HOA, organized a weed pulling party on Saturday in their little pocket park that now belongs to the city. Um, I don't know if you've noticed, there are weeds everywhere. <laughs> and um, I know that, that Diesel has been trying to work with that HOA, and we may need to talk later as a, as a group, maybe at a work session, about how we deal with some of our parks that are um, needing a little extra care. Uh, and also, we have um, a proposal from uh, Wayno Urbonis, who is the environmental health manager for the county. He's putting forth a proposal to the county for an ecosystems services program, which would basically be a countywide employee who would handle issues of sustainability. Um, and he's asking for some letters of approval and because the sustainability committee won't be meeting before his deadline, I'm wanting just to see if this, if the council is okay with me sending um, letters of support for that idea. It would be, um, something we've all been working for actually for a really long time if the county steps up and and establishes a position like that so i just want to get nods or objections <laughs> talk about sustainability? yeah yeah, yeah it's something it's an effort i support yeah. yeah i'd just be sending a letter of support for, for his letter which would go to the commissioners recommending such a program mm. great thanks i had nods and not hearing anything from the computer, so. <laughs> Thank you. That sounds good. All right, let's see. Um, right at the beginning of the meeting, you might have gotten an email uh, from Drew asking about uh, <laughs> attendance at the farmer's market from now until October 16th. Mm -hmm. um, if we could staff that, uh, it would be great. That's, again, a really a good thing, so. You guys, in general, are in favor of doing that again? You bet. Yep. Yeah. I, I guess the only question that I have is, do you want to do it every weekend? Yes. There's, do you want to do it every weekend? You shouldn't do it every weekend. It's 15 weekends. You shouldn't do it every weekend. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, obviously we'll, we'll spread the love around. Nina, I'm sure we'll come down at some point like she did last year. And there's other and folks, too, that we have maybe, on board. So. Maybe some of the folks in the audience that are, you know, heads of departments yeah. might jump up and down and do that, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's department some department serious head. hazard pay they're going to be asking for, right? <laughs> yeah, <that's... laughs> but uh, really, if you, if, if you feel comfortable with every weekend, we can certainly plan that from here on out. I'm thinking every other weekend. I think or or it could be just one person. Not it doesn't necessarily need to be two. Right. Yeah. So you could split it up where you sure. each have just two weekends between now and the end of October. I mean, much. we might want to do something since we don't have to wear a mask this year. It's <laughs> it's, it's going to feel year. weird. Like last year was the only thing. It was the only game in town, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> as weird as that sounds. <laughs> it was. So maybe so, maybe what we'd ask for is just one representative from the council and and. I, we don't have anything to hand out like swag wise so <laughs> we'll come up with something okay forget it <laughs> <laughs> yeah and i think you know obviously saturdays can be kind of tough for me so i wasn't there a ton but when i was able to be there i thought the conversations that you had were pretty valuable yeah mm -hmm. so yeah 
Okay. So like I'm going to volunteer away. you guys. Yeah. I live like a block <laughs> away and I go all the time. So I guess I would be yeah. the most convenient. Right. When I went by there this weekend too, it did look like there were more booths than at any point last year. Yeah. Okay. So it seemed like there's more participants coming back just in, in terms of the other vendors that are there. So it was pretty well attended this last weekend. Nice. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Count me in to do at least three or four of them. Great. Yep. Yeah, we can cover He's overachieving. <laughs> well, I'm not contributing much tonight. So. <laughs> All right. That's excellent. Um, cool. And then um, I don't know if any of you guys were around this weekend. On Sunday, um, <clears throat> there were some things going on on S Mountain there. <laughs> give, a, give a shout out to the fire department that was an amazing was fireworks great. show good job i know it's a that is a lot of work um that was great. then uh, um also uh russ and the police department were doing a great job downtown kind of directing the crowd and being really like interactive and really part of the community i thought that really shined a great light on salida um and then obviously diesel and the parks crew had a heck of a cleanup <laughs> afterwards so thanks guys for that um and uh yeah everybody you know everybody i think kind of pulled together to make that probably the busiest fourth of july i've ever seen in salida it was it was insane it was but yeah. but really well behaved and great crowds having a blast so super cool um yeah that's all I got, I think. Uh, Merle. Uh, Treasurer report, uh, thanks to Amy Tohanovich, our finance director. Just wanted to give you a quick update on the budget process. Uh, last week, the finance director, the assistant, the uh, administrator, our management fellow, and myself met uh, to outline the budget process timeline. The department proposals are already in open gov, so they're in the software. The numbers are there being looked at and staff are working closely with departments on their narratives and metrics, some new improved things that we want to put out this year more than just numbers. Nice. Our next step is the same team's going to start meeting with the departments over the next 10 days, and our attempt is to try to get a draft to the Finance Committee on July 20 for their first look, which is aggressive, as always, but we're there. And uh, this keeps us well on track for presentations to work sessions. We're going to try to minimize the work sessions this year unless there's strategic or structural changes that need to be made and allow us a little more time here to make any adjustments uh, based on trends in the sales taxes which are still alarmingly positive um, <laughs> and we hope that they'll continue that way and also to finalize our budget in October as we did last year so things are well underway right now thanks to staff fantastic yeah um, Nina, anything from the city attorney? Um, yes, there was a public comment that reminded me, um, while it's not appropriate to speak about specific properties and enforcement actions, I wanted to let you all know that we're working on tightening up you know, property maintenance processes. We're meeting with the county on Thursday um, per your um, direction for us to look into the IGA we have with them to provide the building services and just try to, again, tighten up some enforcement. So it is something that staff's been working on. I know Chief Johnson and Drew and everyone has been working a lot very hard on it. So just wanted to update you on that. Okay. Excellent. Um, anything from the staff? I am sure there's something that I've probably forgotten at this point, but uh, I think that you know, getting through the 4th of July weekend is always kind of a, a big step to getting into the kind of the meat of summer, but at the same time, this is kind of like the peak event, right? Where there, this is probably the largest load of folks that we see in town. And uh, we've got a number of different metrics that we're gonna try to use going forward, whether that be traffic counters on the highway or a uh, number of flushes that go into the sewer treatment plant <laughs> to kind of evaluate how many people we see in town. Um, some of those are really great metrics and some of them kind of founder a little bit which is kind of weird but um, all in all I think uh, city's just in a great place right now and and again seeing to, to the mayor's point seeing the crowds around this weekend and just the attitudes and the shift and, and just general happiness and contentment mm -hmm. I thought was pretty impressive um, we do continue to monitor stuff downtown too I've had a number of conversations with business owners about little tweaks and things here that, here and there that we can do I know that there were some suggestions about um, barricades and a few other things with regard to vehicles that were parking in odd locations and a few other things so <laughs> We're, we're constantly chasing our tails on that stuff, but um, just know that staff is out there trying to do the best job we can to keep things tightened up. So that's all I got. 
Awesome. And uh, just real quick, too, I would add that um, the CDOT work on First Street mm -hmm. is coming along really well. Mm -hmm. uh, the bump outs and the improved uh, uh, accessibility will be really good there. And then out on Highway 50, the uh, street light and um, sidewalk and uh, uh, parkway is coming along for the that final piece down to 291. It's looking really good, actually. So that's pretty exciting. If I may, um, I do have one thing to add, and I can't believe I forgot to do this. But I do want to introduce Miriam uh, Luna Gonzalez, who is our management fellow from the University of Colorado, Denver. Um, she will be with us for the next couple of years, um, working closely with administration and all our staff, really, to help um, help us out in, in our dire state of need right now. So we're really happy to have her on board. This is day three. So um, it's equal parts boring and, and drinking from the fire hose. So uh, it's, it, it's really great to have her on board. Welcome. Uh, Welcome. Awesome. All right. Um, we do have a couple of topics for executive sessions that we need to go into and do we need to like do like go into executive session come back out go into executive oh, yeah. session and come back out I would prefer that because um, to separate the two topics for in case there's a, any litigation on one of them or anything okay. like that yeah. All right. if that's okay with you mayor I know I it's forgot my throat launch I know I next time I should bring that by your request thank you <laughs> <laughs> proclamation stuff all right who wants the first one?
got a, are we back on the YouTubes? Are we live again? Yep. Yes. All right, very good. <laughs> All right, the time is now 7.24 and the executive session has concluded. Uh, the participants in the executive session were uh, Justin Critelli, Mike Pollock, Jane Templeton, P.T. Wood, Harold Casper, Dan Shore, Elisa Pappenfort, Drew Nelson, Nina Williams, Sarah Law, uh, Miriam, uh, Luna Gonzalez, uh, Amy Takonovich. 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 Gosh, I know. It's a tongue twister for me tonight for some reason. <laughs> and Doug, Doug Bess. All right. Um, for the record, if any person who participated in the executive session believes that any uh, substantial discussion of any matters not included in the motion to go into executive session occurred during the executive session or that any improper action occurred during the executive session in violation of the open meetings law, I would ask you to state your concerns for the record. Seeing none, the next item in the agenda is another executive session. Uh, before we do that, I will say that uh, we did direct staff in some negotiations on a piece of property during that executive session. Um, and no further action is required at this time. Uh, who wants this one? Let's do it again. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I move to go into an executive session for the purpose of determining positions relative to matters that may be subject to negotiations, developing strategy for negotiations, and or instructing negotiators under CRS section 24-6-4024E, and to discuss the purchase, acquisition, lease, transfer, or sale of real personal or other property interests under CRS section 24-6-4024A. Um, and uh, eminent domain processes. Second. Okay. The motion is second, and the motion is to go into executive session uh, for the purpose of determining positions relative to matters that may be subject to negotiations, developing strategies for negotiations, and or instructing negotiators under CRS section 246402 for Ian for the purpose of discussing, discussing the uh, purchase, is this the purchase, uh, yep, purchase, lease, acquisition, uh, or sale of any real personal or other property interest in accordance with CRS section 246402-4A and following uh, for information for identification purposes is for the uh, uh, eminent domain process. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Aye. <laughs> okay, the computer delay, but sounds like we're all good. All right. Now off into the next executive session, which we will do on this as soon as we're off of uh, YouTube. Okay. <laughs> yes.
think we're good. Not, Are we you, good? No, we usually get a, I usually get Okay. A, okay. Yep, okay, there thumbs it is. up. All right, great. The time is now 7.52, and the executive session has concluded. Uh, the participants in the executive session were Justin Critelli, Mike Pollock, Jane Templeton, P.T. Wood, Harold Casper, Dan Shore, Elisa Pappenfort, Drew Nelson, Nina Williams, Sarah Law, Amy Tahonovich, Miriam Luna Gonzalez. Great job. I wrote it down. I, I have trouble keeping all those letters straight in my head if it's not written down for me. <laughs> it's true. I don't, I don't. I'm not a, you know, I have a lot of things that I have trouble keeping straight in my head. Um, <laughs> <laughs> For the record, if any person who participated in the executive session believes that any uh, substantial discussion of any matters not included in the motion to go into executive session occurred during the executive session or that any improper action occurred during the executive session in violation of the open meetings law, I would ask that you state your concerns for the record. Seeing none, the next agenda item is probably to adjourn, but I will say before we do that that uh, uh, we were talking about uh, an eminent domain and gave staff direction for negotiations. Uh, a, a, adjournment, I guess, is the only thing left. Uh, I move we adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Hey, thanks, guys. That was amazing. Have a lot of Thank you, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> That's a lot crammed into three hours right there. <laughs>